okay, all right. Welcome back to the Make Lemonade podcast, the show brought to you by Lemon Squeezes. We hope to inspire you to earn money from your own lemonade stand. I'm one of your co-host, James, and my usual co-host, JRFR, is off today. So I'm going solo with our guest, who is very special indeed. Today, I'm joined by Jack McDade, who is the creator of Statomic, a content management system for Laravel. He's also just launched his new course, Radical Design, which teaches people Jack's unique approach to design and building products. And when I say unique approach, I really do mean it. All you have to do is scroll through Jack's sites, have a look at his personal website, Statomic, the Radical Design landing page, to be immediately entertained by the little nuggets of flair dropped in throughout. In the world of boring landing pages and everyone just doing the same thing, it's nice to have a bit of Jack out in the world. So I've actually got a quick fire round for you where you just have to answer one of these two options without thinking. Did you have a look at them or am I going to get you without? Nope, I didn't cheat. I'd like Hell the yeah, honor system. Let's go. All yeah. right, let's go. First one, YouTube or podcasts? YouTube. Skateboarding or rollerblading? Rollerblading. Ted Lasso or Cool Runnings? Oh my God, you're such, you're so mean. <laughs> oh, that is really hard. I think I'd probably have to say Ted Lasso though. A world full of comic sans or a world full of boring websites? Oh, this is also really mean. Boring websites. I think I could, eventually I could get off the internet and I could, just don't think I could deal with comic sans in the real world. Van Neistat or Casey Neistat? Oh, another good question. I'd say Casey iPhone yeah. camera or DSLR? Depends. DSLR. Okay. So that I that is quite interesting. You've answered differently than I thought you would do for some of those. I thought you would do Comic Sans. I think you would come up with some way to creatively make Comic Sans interesting <laughs> across the internet of websites. I'm surprised you didn't yeah. go Van Neistat, man. I was watching some of your content again, and it definitely has some Van Neistat oh, influence. And since he's been I... vlogging... Yeah, I definitely do draw in inspiration. Those are my two biggest influences, Van and Casey. I don't know if I yeah. posted that somewhere. Clearly, you've got me dialed. So JR's not here, but he did send me a voice note, Jack. So okay. I'm going to play that voice note here so you can hear what JR has to say, and then we'll get into the conversation there. James, what's up, man? Sorry I can't make it to Jack's recording. I'm actually bummed because big fan of his and his work. And uh, I remember looking at his headless CMS back in the day. Honestly, my questions would come from my days in the hosting world, and I understand the benefits of his, but like, I know how like the hosting companies think about distribution, how to get people to use WordPress. I know how Matt and Automatic think about that. So how does Jack and him think about just distribution? Like, how do I get more people using his CMS and why? And But honestly, I'm actually really excited just to listen to this one from afar. So yeah, good luck, and we'll see you next week. There you go. JR's voice. So let's talk a bit about Statomic for you, Jack. Take me back 12 years. What was the story about starting it, if people don't know? Yeah, I mean, the really quick version. Uh, I wanted a CMS that was easy for one person to manage multiple clients and multiple ongoing projects. And all the database-driven ones at the time like, were really bad at like, hey, I launched a site and I want to work on it, but the client's like editing content. And so every time I go to like push the blog up. They've already added new pages and articles and like the database has changed. So I have to like turn the site off and pull the database down and merge the changes and then put it all back in, put the database back up and you know, that whole part of it. Or you just do everything on prod and like the site's like halfway is broken like every time you're working on it. And I didn't want either of those things. I'm like, well, I just thought, well this is just text. Like you're literally just pushing like HTML or just words up and down. That's all that's changing. Why can't I just put that in Git and build a whole CMS around that workflow? And so that's that's how Statomic was born. And 12 years later... <laughs> Has it been sort of growing over the last few years? Is it just... Uh, yeah. Because you, you actually took like six, seven years to go full-time on this. It was a slow and steady burn for you. But since yeah. you have gone full-time, hired a team, last few years, good growth with Statomic? Yeah, it's like 20, 30% year over year. Over oh, year, wow. Year, over year, over year. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely gotten to a pretty good spot. And is that a result of your marketing or are you appealing to new verticals of customers? <sighs> Honestly, it's probably neither. Our marketing is pretty terrible slash non-existent. And we've really only relied on word of mouth. Like 95% of what we do is just word of mouth. So what I do is try to make the best product possible and build as many strong relationships with people in the community as I can and then hope for the best. It's been enough. I had I were were I to take VC money and pour it all on ads and da -da -da -da, <laughs> like yeah, I'm sure we could add a zero at the end or something, but I don't want to do that. 
I'd rather have a smaller, scrappier business that I love, that has grown at the scale of our capacity and our desire and our momentum. And it's been a lot more fun this way. I mean, too many people try to like get profit over anything, everything, like that's the only ultimate goal. And I've optimized for flexibility and joy in it all. And I'm much happier. That is such a good point, Jack. Optimizing for flexibility and joy. So many people when they're starting out on their entrepreneurship journey can often sacrifice those things when it is one of the single hardest things you can do going out on your own. And mm -hmm. if you can't enjoy it or get the flexibility to take on all that risk and extra pressure you get with running a business, what is the point in doing that? And some people want to go down the VC route because they feel like they've got an option and an, an ability to go for that. It's not for everyone. And for you, that's just the way you feel static. Uh, so good for you for doing that. Are you like mostly getting people migrating off the other CMSs? Yeah, most of them are. Most of them are moving from WordPress, Drupal, craft. I mean, agencies will like try it out. Agencies are our like primary customer. They're not our only customer, but if we're going to target somebody, it's going to be a company that makes a dozen or 50 websites a year versus like one team that builds one site. We're just priced that way, right? From more of a volume play. And so that's, you know, we'll, we'll get an agency, try it out and like, oh my God, this is so much better than what we've been using all this time. You know, they're usually just, if you're going to start looking for another CMS and actually taking the time to try it out and learn it and go through the docs and watch a couple of videos and all of that, you have to be kind of semi-serious or you got to be pretty dissatisfied with your current platform. And what happens is they'll fall in love. Then they'll convince the next client to like, all right, we should totally use the CMS and they'll build one site. And they're like, right, we're all in. All we do is static now. We got to convince all of our all of our clients to switch over when the time is right. And, you know, that's kind of our primary core, core audience. So if you say your marketing is not good, but the product is what is leading to more people using it, what are you doing with the product? What is your approach to building it, shipping new features, or is it just a good stable product that you don't have to massively innovate on because people like it for what it is and they're dissatisfied with the alternatives? Well, there's a bit of that. I think it has gotten a lot more mature, and especially over the last couple of years. But it, I say the two things we really do is focus on a really, really, really good developer experience first. So developers fall in love with it, which means businesses go like, oh my God, we can build a static site like a third of the time as a WordPress site or a quarter of the time as a Drupal site or, or whatever it is. So they start to see like the cost benefit of that and then the the ease of maintaining a site because everything's in in version control and everything's like configurable and overridable and extendable and everything and so when we get that buy-in it's a lot easier for those 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 teams or that leadership and the and the agencies to say we should like try to push this out more we should switch to this yeah so that that really good developer experience goes a long way and then the second thing we really focus on is a really good content authoring experience. So the person who doesn't know how to code logs into the control panel and finds stuff intuitively like, oh, like here's a, like a, a nav tree of all the pages on my site. Oh, and this is where the blog entries are and you click it and there's the list of them and I can filter them and sort them and click it and hit, you know, it works the way you, you kind of think, like it's, you, you see the structure of your site, you can just dive right in and edit stuff. Whereas, you know, WordPress specifically can be really well built if you have someone who knows what they're doing. Typically what happens in a WordPress site is they build, they just click install on a bunch of plugins and then it's like, well, okay, so on this page, you got to use categories actually shows you, you know, like images on the sidebar, but on this section, you have to go over and use this other plugin to edit, you know, this thing. And then yeah. some stuff is in the advanced custom fields and some stuff is over here. And you kind of like need this manual to figure out like, I'm just trying to freaking like change the copyright info in my footer. Where did it go? And the, there's nowhere consistent from project to project where it can be for a lot of people. Definitely not everybody. I don't want to like knock on people who use WordPress for a living because you can be great at it. It can be a great tool. Your clients can be super happy. That does happen. It just doesn't happen all the time. And I'm going after those people that aren't having that experience. Oh yeah, dude. I think there's definitely something to be said for products that uh, uh, just work and they're not over bloated and over complicated. I'm looking for simple options. I don't want the Google Analytics experience. That shit is awful to use. I want to be <laughs> yes. using Fathom yeah. or Plausible or something where I can actually get to the data that I want and fulfill the task. And Statum, it seems like it does that better than the other platforms out there, which are just so bloated and horrid. 
Yeah. In my opinion. Uh, I agree too. That's my opinion as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, what's your day to day look like, Jack? Are you working on Statomic full time? We will talk about your side projects and the stuff you've done over the last couple of months. But generally for you day to day, what does it look like? Yeah, generally day to day, it's, you know, I, I jump into Slack, see what's up in the team, look at, you know, like progress, PR, see what we're tracking, make sure we're, we're working towards the next milestone, which, you know, we have a couple milestones throughout the year, just like we do an annual release, like the big release, and then there's like feature projects that we want to tackle. So, you know, catch up on that, do, do support, answer customer questions. And then when all the, you know, anybody who needs Jack stuff is over, I tend to then focus on either you know, writing or design, you know, new, new landing pages, new blog posts, like updating the UI for the marketplace. Like there's just, there's a lot of touch points and I'm the only front end design guy in the company. So like, I would like to not be that at some point, but I haven't let go yet. It's just a bit all me. And then, you know, if, if, if I'm, I'm caught up on that stuff, there's always code to write because I can write I can write code as well. Usually, you know, JavaScript like UI stuff for the control panel or yeah. Have you tried to hire for that front end design role and it's just No, I have not I've not tried once. I haven't wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't is it is it do, do you feel you'd feel better if you relinquish some of that and you sort of let someone express because you you've hired in so many other areas of the business. Every every other aspect. And you, you can like express your design creativity in the other areas of your life that you can do side projects, chat with date stuff. So would that be something you'd be interested in doing because you can express that creativity elsewhere? I mean, maybe, I don't know. Like it's, it's my sandbox. Maybe it shouldn't be. I think recently I have, I've come up against this sentiment that maybe me treating the Statomic brand as like, a fun space to play with is not the best thing for the company. I'm not saying I'm doing anything irresponsible with it. I, I, it's very thoughtful, intentional, but there are like, so we, we do this annual conference called flat camp and flat camp is a retreat style conference. So there's no official planned talks with speakers and stuff. It's much more organic and relational and it's way more powerful. And we get into way more depth, both technical and business and roadmap, but it happens on the small group, like while we're, you know, going for a hike or while we're, you know, playing pool or, or sitting around the table having, having food, right? So it's like three day experience and it's awesome, but it's, it's hard for people to buy off like bosses or quote bosses, right? Like the higher ups in a company to say, yeah, I'm going to totally send my employee onto what looks like a vacation. And like, supposedly he's going to come back with information, <laughs> right? It's while the experience is, I think the most ideal version of what we could possibly do for a conference, maybe the way I position it is more for the, the person who wants to go rather than the person who has the wallet, the paycheck or the, the, the checkbook. So I need to think about that. I need to think about what potentially what, what implications like, or, or limitations we're putting on people who want to just use Statomic or want to do stuff and can't because it just doesn't look like what they expect it to. But then as soon as I think that, I'm like, screw everybody, man. Like, let's just go <laughs> double down, like full MTV, baby. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what happens. So I don't hire the role and then I don't change anything. And here we are. I do think that's part of the beauty of it though, Jack, and could be what leads to so much of the success that you've had. Because it's got your Jamma Data stamp on it, compared to all of your other stuff, it is more tame. It is slightly more professional. It's still, you definitely got that flavor, that radicalness, the fun colors and little touches on it that yeah. I think makes what you do so cool. But it, it's just toned up back a bit and maybe maybe if you hire that out you might lose some of that mm -hmm. special sauce that you love so much and it's your baby dude you've been doing this for 12 years like if you hire if you raise vc maybe you wouldn't have the opportunity to do this at all but i know it's up to you and it's an interesting conversation to have it is and you're you're totally right i think part of me is afraid that if i let that piece of it go i won't i won't feel invested enough in any aspect of it yeah. And that I'll want to just sell it and move on. And I don't want to do that. I love being, you know, in the community, you know, being on point in some of those roles in the community and in the product life cycle and product owner. And 
I still love building websites and making the best tool I can to make the best website you can. And if I just, if I just worked on the business and was never in the mix at some point, I'd be like, I'd just be looking at the numbers being like, man, I could, I could not work again or I, you know, whatever, like at some point, you know, and I, I, I don't want to tempt myself with that right now. I think that's fair enough. Well, let's move on to Radical Design, your labor of love side project that you, I believe, announced in 2020, Jack, and then launched it four years later, almost pretty much four years on the dot later. Now, I am both disappointed and impressed because Mm. it's disappointing that someone would launch it and then struggle to produce it. But I also understand impressed that you managed to leave it that long and then still launch it at the end. So talk to me, Jack, inception of that course four years ago, why you wanted to make it and how you actually got round to pushing through and making it. It is impressive, dude. (laughs) Thank you. It was I mean, in full honesty, the timing couldn't have been worse and more against me from like I announced it in February 2020, uh, March 2020, the world fell apart. Right. And it was like, May- <laughs> nobody cares about this right now. I don't know if we're going to survive. Right. Like, I, you know, it was the beginning of the pandemic. And so I just like I, I shelved it. And then we moved. We moved to Florida. And we were meeting new people and friends and doing all sorts of fun stuff. And it just like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head into the task of like, all right, I got to like buckle down for a couple months and really grind out, you know, the outline and start filming and producing and editing and, and designing. And it's like not a, a design course is, is really hard because you not only does you, do you have to create the video content and do the design, you have to design the stuff that you're going to design ahead of time sometimes. And then you got to design the site and the video, like all of it has to look good from like end to end from soup to nuts, like the whole thing. You can't just like drop it on a, you know, a platform with like, just click the next video. Like it has to be better than that or else you're not selling, you know, what you're selling or you're not, I think you know what I'm saying. Anyway. So like the, 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 the bar I had for what I wanted the course to be was so, so high that I couldn't get started. Like I, I, I just kept losing traction and like slipping and slipping and I would start and then I would be like, Oh my God, I would start to like get these like panic attacks. Like this is so much work. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, especially while running Statomic on, you know, as my full-time business, I thought I was going to do this like nights and weekends and one day a week. And Nights and weekends are full of really fun stuff and kids sports and going fishing and boating and like traveling around Florida, going to Disney and all that kind of thing. Like, and I don't want my kids to suffer because I have to get this course out that I announced, but someone messages me like every single day. Hey, when's it coming? What's it coming? What's it coming? What's it coming? I would get a DM like every single day. But then at the, the end of 2020, I was getting geared back up and I actually got some momentum. And then, you know, just some stuff in my personal life hit and I, I had a total, like mental health breakdown that lasted probably six to eight months. I couldn't Mm -hmm. write. I couldn't create. I couldn't do anything where I like, where I could would put my name on it. And it took a long time to kind of come back to Jack, the creator and not just like Jack, the survivor, you know, just trying to like be physically like present. So that was like well over, yeah, six, eight months, really more than a year or two. And like some, there's some, I still have some lingering health problems that have made it really hard for, I have like brain fog that comes on and lasts for like weeks or months where I can't even think straight. And sometimes my, like I write my letters backwards and like, it gets really bad. Mm. So I would keep hitting these, these, like I would start and I'd stop and I'd start and I'd stop. And I just decided last year, like I need to de- get this thing done because I'm tired of the DMs and I said I would do it. And the one thing I decided like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I went out on my, or actually 15 years ago, when I went out on my own, it was like, don't overcommit. But when you, when you say you're going to do something, just do it. Like you have to do it. All you have to do is not do the thing you say once. And then you're a guy who doesn't do it. And he says, so I just made myself do it. I took a month off from Statomic, like a full month sabbatical. And it turns out it really needed like three or four months. <laughs> but I got, you know, I, I got it. I got through the content. I lowered the scope a little bit and actually I think I ended up being better for it. Cause I think I was trying to do 
more than was necessary and was able to streamline like really the important stuff. And yeah, I shipped it in February. Congrats on getting it shipped. And that's quite <laughs> an interesting or a useful way to how to get over some of the challenges that you've gone through. And I will point people to the mental health episode I did with JR, where we spoke about both of our challenges with it. And dude, I can relate so much to months of not being able to fulfill anything, barely even getting by. I don't know what you went through and how that affected you, but for me, it was absolutely crippling. And it took mm -hmm. me a while to come out the other side and a lot of reflecting to figure out how I can function as a human being. And I was putting so much pressure on myself to be successful with whatever I do to put out the perfect product that I had to realize that sometimes that's not possible. And you've just mm -hmm. got to be kinder to yourself. And if that means doing the bare minimum, do the bare minimum for a while. Yep. It's, it's okay. Like your health, your mental health, being there for your family is more important than this work stuff that we, that we all sit in front of our little screens and do. Yeah, so <laughs> 100%, yes. But for you, reducing that scope, being someone that says, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it is impressive because I am someone who doesn't want to be that person who says I'm going to do something and then not do it but I found myself falling into it and it does not feel good if you'd have never launched this Jack or if it kept going and kept going you would have felt so awful because there was a lot of excitement of how can I design like Jack um, yeah. how can I take his approach so I'm just kudos to you I don't know if enough people have said it it is so impressive that you managed to get that launched and out the door Good for you. So what? why Thanks, did James. you want to create this course? What is your approach to design? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted to record, make the course because, I mean, on a couple levels, I love video content. I love mm -hmm. making video content. Super fun. It's like my favorite thing in the world. And when you're thinking about, all right, well, what do I create content on? Like, what do I even make? You got to, like, come up with a thing. Well, I, I think the thing I do differently than a lot of people is design, which is kind of obvious that this should be design related. Like I can write code and tailwind and PHP, but like not like better than anybody else or, or in a unique way. We're all kind of like trying to achieve the same sort of thing, but design, I feel like it, my look and style and approach is different than a lot of people. And certainly it draws on a lot of inspiration of stuff that, that came before. Like I'm pulling in a lot of you know, eighties and nineties kind of retro aesthetic. Like I didn't invent those. I'm just borrowing them and hashing them up and remixing them into like new, you know, new, new outlets or new, new versions of those things. And I wanted to make it a YouTube play at first. Like, let me just like become a YouTuber. But the more I dug into what it takes to actually make a living on, I don't know if you've looked into it. It's, um, it's pretty hard. Uh, and we just kind of went through if, if you are someone who watches YouTubers in general, like the, the category of people who do this for a living, a bunch of them just quit because they all burned out like in a sequence there was like dominoes like they just bam 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 like tom scott and then a couple other guys and then boom and then everyone's like oh thank god they quit because now we have something to talk about and every youtuber was like here's why the youtubers are quitting I'm like oh it's like this whole world anyway long story short i decided like if i were to put this stuff out on youtube nobody would notice it nobody i feel like we just totally go under the radar nobody would watch it and so if i packaged it up in a course and just put maximum effort in, do videos in that YouTube style that I like. It's kind of very yeah. like Casey Neistat, Van Neistat, like vloggy, like, you know, I sometimes like leave the computer, I grab the camera and we go for a walk and talk and you know, that kind of thing. And I wanted to do that, but like package it up as a course that hopefully will cause someone to be like, all right, I had, I had to pay money for it because I paid for it. I'll, I have to watch it now. And I, and, and this is what he says, like, I need to do. So I should do that if I want to get anything out of this because I paid money to do it. And I was hoping that that would be the way that would work. And that's, that's why I decided to do it. Yeah. Th those that can be successful with a small YouTube audience or building an audience from scratch, either do it for years and years and years and then sell something like a course or some sort of digital product off the back of that. But you've got to spend the years building that audience on YouTube or as yeah. If you launch your course, which the, the lower tier is $350, then you can build your audience elsewhere, aka Twitter, a list, email list, and you can launch it to them and you can convert a small amount 
and it doesn't take that it's still hard work but it means you don't have to churn out that youtube content which could potentially give away all of the other content that you've already put in the course so it is a strategy it's just a longer term one and you're still uploading to youtube yeah. and I, I foresee you making many more youtube videos in the future um oh yeah the- uh, for sure i'm now that the course is done like i couldn't justify like i need to get <laughs> this stuff done all my video stuff for a while was only <laughs> the radical design course videos. Yeah. But now that I've got it out, I do plan to add more videos throughout the year, but it's not, I'm not pushing out. I was trying to get through like three lessons a week and then it was like two lessons a week. And then sometimes it was like one lesson a week because they were just really involved. Yeah, I think I can start to go back to like, let me just try to drop something each month and, and then on the Statomic channel as well, tutorial stuff. I want to get back into that. I just do love making video. And as for you and your style, taking a lot of inspiration from the 70s, the 80s, retro style, you referenced the book Steal Like an Artist by Austin Cleon. That's one of my favorites as well. Mm -hmm. You may say you're taking inspiration from it, but you're completely reformatting that inspiration. You're taking something that was analog and bringing it into a digital world in a sea where, sea of internet where everything looks the same. We spoke about this before, Jack. Yeah. Every landing page looks the same. You've got to do something surely to try and stand out Mm -hmm. and using your approach to design where you add in some personality is the way to do it. Can you like explain like some of your uh, approaches, some of the techniques that if they take the course, they can sort of learn some of your approach on how to do that? Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to give away what I would even call the secret sauce. And it's really simple. Really, what you need to do is become a digital hoarder. You need to be a curator. And so throughout your life, uh, your day-to-day life, as you go to the grocery store and you go to work and you, you ride the subway and whatever, everything that jumps out at you is like, ooh, like that was cool. I, you, whatever it is, it's a, a billboard, a sign, a newspaper, someone's shirt, a backpack, a magazine cover, the title credits for a movie, like anything, anything, anywhere you go, like take a picture of everything that stands out to you as being like cool. Just And then build a giant, giant folder full of all of that stuff. And then use that as your starting starting point for experimentation. So like you, mo- a lot of people, what they do is like, well, I have to design this website. And so you open up Sketch or Figma or whatever, and you've got a blank slate and you're like, okay, well, let me go to an inspiration gallery website and look at all the websites that have come out recently. And they're either all the same thing <laughs> or so elaborate and insane, like with WebGL and like all this crazy stuff, you're like, <laughs> I can't do that. And so then you like get depressed and you drink and you know, you, you binge eat at one o'clock in the morning and you're like, well, I got to get this going. So you just like kind of do something similar to what you did last time and you make it green instead of blue. Right. And so if you have this giant library of inspiration and you use that, everything, you know, you, you pick two items from your inspiration folder and make a random design experiment every day from that. Like, oh, I like this magazine cover and also this bumper sticker I saw on the back of a Suburban. I'm going to match those two things up. I can do a bumper sticker in the style of that magazine and just do a little 10 minute, 15 minute design experiment and build up a whole library of those things. Next time you go to start a new design project, you've got 20, 50, 100, 1000 design experiments of like stuff that's already in motion that already has like fonts picked out that has like colors and, and whatever. And you just go in and start pawing through all that stuff and be like, all right, I've got this, I've got this, I've got that. And all of a sudden you've got stuff on the page. Now you're editing. You're not even like creating from scratch. You're like editing, like taking away stuff that doesn't look good. And you're adding some stuff that like now that the ball is going and you've got momentum, it gets a lot easier. And that is the secret sauce. And if you do that, what happens is the way you curate all of that stuff becomes your personal design style. Like all the things that look good to you, but as you curate piles of this kind of similar sort of energy, you sort of kind of take it on, you like absorb it and then it comes out of you when you design. And so like, I could I could fake it. I could spend a week with a totally different design style. And I, I did this when I had to do client work. It's mm-hmm. like, all right, well, this is what they really like. This is what their industry is. So I'll just consume all this stuff and take all my screenshots and inspiration, and build out a folder. And like pretend I love it (laughs) and then use that to make my designs and it works. Uh, I've 
seen how you actually apply this approach because you release some free content if you go to radicaldesign.com and look through some of the lessons you can see how you actually curate stuff so i use my mind to curate stuff i never go into it your approach is just putting everything in a folder and this is your inspiration and you like flick through it one thing you said was that you want it to be unorganized so you're like mm -hmm. gathering information as you're looking through as you're searching that is where the inspiration is coming from and then you show how you apply this to redesigning websites and what was the example you used the alpine alpine day uh, yeah. alpine day yeah you showed how you actually curated inspiration and your process behind creating that site and then redesigning boring rails as well and even how you used ai now ai is an interesting one jack for you because mm. you would think that you're so creative with your stuff ai pff, you can you can do stuff that's better but you're actually embracing mid-journey talk to me yeah. about how you're doing that and how you're having fun with embracing ai to improve your radical design yeah so for me i'm not a uh i'm not an illustrator or a 3d modeler like i can't draw some crazy you know complicated thing i have to find something that's already done and use it and so I can buy stock photos or I can, you know, I, I have a subscription to Envato Elements that has a ton of stuff in there that I can pull in. And I mean, I certainly can do some and I'll combine things and edit it and recolor things, whatever. But I like, I, I look at what I'm doing as more like digital collages more than it is me designing from scratch everything. Mm -hmm. So I look at tools like MidJourney as a great way to have, when there's an idea in my head, that I can't make myself and I can't find on, you know, an asset library or uh, even can't find a, a, maybe an illustrator or, or, or an artist who I can contract to do stuff. Cause I've done that too. If I can't find someone in that style, like maybe I can describe it and maybe mid journey can make up something and I'll use that and I'll have it like, well, I'm looking for a, you know, a, you know, a deer with a huge pair of antlers that is wearing like a bomber jacket and wearing neon colors, like smoking a pipe in a library. You're like, okay, well, let's see what happens. And then you refine your, your prompt and you get what you're looking for. Then you cut that out and put that in the middle of your, you know, design composition. And it's original. It's unique. It works like save me money from paying an ill in, from paying an artist. And it's all just any, anything can work as long as you have the rights to use it don't steal and use someone else's creative work but if you can license it you don't have to design every single element in your designs it's totally okay to pull in stuff from third-party sources i do it every single project every single time yeah that's quite interesting i've always thought of designers as um someone that does create everything from scratch but seeing the stuff you do and seeing how unique it is that's actually given me confidence as someone who does end up using assets already created by other people and using ai to help my inspiration that you just curate this stuff and you can still produce stuff that's really unique is your hero yeah. image on statomic mid-journey yep 100 percent. so cool so cool i did some light photoshopping i had to clean yeah. it up a little bit but yeah i didn't make that like I've, what, I dreamed it. I described it. <laughs> <laughs> what relevance yeah. does it have? Like, what, what was your thinking there? For, for um, those that are listening to audio only, it is a, a deer with sunglasses in this sort of neo-punk style. It just looks really cool. Yeah, it's just a vibe, man. It's, um, <laughs> that's all it is. It's our, our, our logo and, and brand for a long time was two sets of antlers. Cause like that's the, the template language syntax is two curly mm. braces and they look like antlers. And so our that's template cool. language is called antlers. And so we kind of leaned into that for a long time from a branding perspective. We had mountains and it was a really outdoor vibe. And then I kind of got in the eighties and nineties thing. And I'm like, nobody's doing this. I, unfortunately, everybody's doing it now. So like, how can I sort of take what I love and bring back the, the roots of where we were. And so this like Neo retro, cyberpunky outdoor wilderness vibe is kind of like what I was going for. It's not the permanent solution for the homepage. It's getting, I'm currently redesigning it right now, but it was something I had fun with. He'll probably move. His name is Buckshot Thunderstride. We named him as a team. I love that. And, Buckshot Thunderstride. <laughs> you, yeah. You click on him and he says quotes in the voice, in the voice of Kratos from God of War. And I used 11 labs, like the AI voice generator. I did like a, a model of 
Kratos, the, that voice actor, and like made him say a bunch of stuff like "Stop touching me," and, you know that kind of thing. So yeah, he'll probably move to the four hundred four page or like down, yeah. like hidden in the footer. He's a little bit too prominent right now, but I just was having fun with it and wanted it for a little while. So this is yeah. what I'm saying about the little details that I said in the intro. These sound effects, if you scroll through your jammaday.com slash design, you can see all of these little Easter eggs and nuggets throughout. On our Indie Bytes episodes, we were talking about how you come up with sound effects. Uh, it's another that people don't use enough on websites. So yeah. I think I just realized why I do that recently. I thought it was totally my idea, but I don't know if you've ever played like old games like Space Quest or no. King's Quest. Like this is a genre that like barely exists anymore of video games. And they're like these click, they're like click adventures where you're like, what's the other big one? Escape from like uh, return from monkey Island. Anyway, yeah. you're like a guy and you click on stuff to like pick it up and use this item here and like talk to that. And if you click on something that it didn't mean for you to click on space quest had a voice actor, like say something for every item, like everything in the whole world was like some joke. I was like, I wouldn't do that if I were you or like taste disgusting or whatever. <laughs> and I think that was so fun. Like I had more fun just clicking on random stuff in the game than actually playing the game. And I've taken that as like part of my design style. It's like, I just want to put lots of little like random elements that if you click on them, something happens. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, man. I love that. I, I would, let's, let's talk about the launch of the course how you because sure. i realized we've just skipped over that completely because i've been interested in your process but <laughs> yeah four years ago were you like collecting emails when you launched yep. this when there was a little bit of hype and how did the actual launch of the course go or was it just post on twitter email out to the list that you built up over the last few years yeah so that was i mean that, that landing page radical design coming soon was <laughs> there for a long time and it was an email collection form. So I think by the time I was ready to launch, there was, I think, 6,000 emails on that list. And without marketing it, just like it's sitting there. And, you know, I, I try to tee up and kind of, come as, as Adam Wathen says, like compress the spring by like sharing some, some ideas yeah. and thoughts and, and, and some like snippets from the course before launch to get people excited. And I got another bump of email addresses, people signing up ready to know, like it's actually coming now. Not only am I working on it, like I'm actually close to <laughs> launching it. I, w I waited until I was like 90% done before I even said I was working on it because I didn't want to do it again, the whole thing. And then four years from now, we'd be having a podcast like, Jack, you finally did it. It took you eight years. You know, I didn't want that. So I, you know, I think, I probably didn't compress the spring enough. I think I probably could have finished the course and then spent maybe two or three months like pulling out 30 second sound bites and different things and like really, really like teeing that up. But I was just so happy to get it out there and I wanted it to be available for people who I'm st would still get DMs like, hey, I'm, I'm starting a new project now and I still really need that course that I signed up for for the notification for like three and a half years ago. And I'm like, all right, well, it's out. Ta-da, you can have it. <laughs> Enjoy. So yeah, it was like tweet. I, I emailed everybody I knew with like a big audience, you know, in the weeks leading up to it, like, hey, I'm watching it on Tuesday, the whatever it was. Is there any chance that you would be willing to tweet about it? Not a retweet, like a tweet. If you could give me a tweet, I would love it. If you don't want to do that, it's totally fine. I think everybody, everybody did it. And it was, I mean, like launch week was awesome. It was a great week. Yeah. And, and then flatline after that, like every other video course that's ever, ever come out. And now on the other side of it, I see why people do cohorts because it gives you like two or three or four times a year where you can kind of build up the hype again and then fear of missing out where people are like, well, I have to get on it now or I have to wait until next year. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that makes makes a lot of sense. I just, I, I hate artificial scarcity and I hate disingenuine marketing and it just rubbed me like there's, n I don't want to do a, a live session every week. Like that was just one thing I didn't want to do. Yeah. It's, it's also, it, it's right for you. That's the format that eh, right. you as Jack McDade, who also full-time runs Statomic, can't really do this as a cohort thing. Whereas for right. me with minor course, Pod Academy, I'm going to run that cohort because the course I did before was self-paced and I have the time to do it cohort. And I think I can help people yeah, guide it. through from start to launch of something and they yep. still can get the self-paced one if they want to go down that route. But 
for you, I think that totally makes sense, but you do have that flatlining. If you do want to consistently make sales, you have to consistently push it. And as this was a side project for you, where do you see it going? Is this something you're just happy now after four years, you actually got it launched and you're going to be like, right, cool, I've done that. It's out there. I'll drip it if anyone wants to buy it, but Stadamic is my thing. Or is it something that you're just going to sort of play with over the, over the next few years, marketing a little bit? Yeah, I'm not sure because there's I have ideas on how, where I could take it. And those ideas were kind of hedged by how successful will it be? Is it worth me doing multiple courses like Radical? You know, I own some other domain names, right? Like <laughs> Radical UI and Radical, you know, like whatever. Naturally. Um, naturally, of course, you got to own some domain names. And so I was like, all right, well, if it makes if it makes half a million dollars, this is what I'm doing. Like this is, you know, whatever. Like, okay. Well, what if it does a tenth of that? What are you going to do, Jack? And so that's, you know, that's more the neighborhood I'm in. It's like, okay, it's out. It's done enough that it's, it's worth having had done it, even just from the, from the mental level. Like, great, I did it. I promised people that I would have more videos, that it will be ongoing content. Like lifetime access means something more than the 32 videos it ships with. So I, I'm committed to that. I've already released one since launching the course. Got another one I'm working on. So the frequency won't be like every week or anything, but every month or so I want to get a video up. So there's that. But if I can find a way to market it in a way that has a lot more traction than what I'm doing now, which is just like trying to reference it in a tweet and like mm -hmm. write a blog post and like hope someone talks about it or like do the podcast tour or talk about it in a, at a conference. Like if I can get a more passive way to market it, then I may do... I might broaden it. I might do another course or I may go deeper or, you know, I own some domain names for some ideas like Rad City. Like I could build a whole universe of this kind of stuff. But my gut says it probably won't happen because I don't know that I'll ever have enough time to get it to the next order of magnitude. And that's okay. Yeah. And for you as running starting to me that puts a particular pressure on your time you are not someone that has unlimited time you have kids Correct. you have a family you have hobbies you want to do uh, building an entire course business around it which has a marketing engine that fuels it is like a full-time job as well so yeah really it's like more than one person's full-time job so <laughs> yeah 100 percent. we'll see if like if it were if it happened organically which almost nothing does anymore mm. that would be a different matter but it's it takes like there's no, I don't know, passive income is really, really hard. It's, it's like such a myth. You have to keep putting energy in. It's like, maybe it's not a one-to-one -one on your time, but if you don't put energy in consistently, you don't get anything out. It just eventually just flattens out. So yeah, yeah. I think YouTube is kind of a good way to make the income as passive as it can be. You will have to make the content, but if you can make it evergreen, build up that library, people continue watching it, that then compounds then yes. that's maybe the closest way to get some passive income because you've already made the content that helps fuel some sales. For Right, yeah, like like Mark Rober, for example, be a YouTuber yeah. who does, who pitches and pushes Crunch Labs in every one of his videos now. He used to have sponsors. They're all his own, com like Crunch Labs, like Project in a Box subscription service for kids. And he does these really cool videos where he builds something or does some crazy adventure with science, tech, and engineering. And, and then like, time out, let's talk about in my case, radical design. Like I could do that. I just haven't come up with the hook. What am I gonna do videos on? Cause I, I don't wanna do more tutorial, like YouTube tutorial videos on design. All that stuff's already in the course and really should be, if I just gave away everything for free from now on out, what was that lifetime subscription for? Well, that lifetime access for if you're not actually getting anything additional. So I need to find outside of the actual tutorial type stuff, I need a hook that I could use to create content that's both interesting and entertaining and drives people back. Yeah. And I haven't got any ideas. James, what do you think? Uh, I, I was just thinking because I will run into the same thing with the podcasting content. And the only thing that comes to mind to me, the stuff that I won't go on the course is like, teardowns and recreations so what you did with boring rails and what steve shoga did when he was launching refactoring ui thank you refactoring ui i used to love watching those videos and it makes you so interested in buying whatever they're selling so yeah teardowns i think 
whatever you are interested in, the content that you make is interesting enough. The design content that works well is redesigning this in X style, taking Stripe website. What is it like in the radical style? People mm. will lap that stuff up. But in terms of what you can actually teach in the course, there's oh, it's only so limited. I can only show people how to make a podcast once like that is how you make it i can update <laughs> yeah, it right. i can Im- but it, i can't just put all of that stuff on youtube or can i i don't know so it, it, it's hard but i think just keeping shipping youtube content and figuring out what it is over time might be a better way than like trying to figure out what's the perfect thing uh but yeah i, I like the idea of the tear downs and recreations in your style i would love to see more ha- how you would approach some of these cookie cutter websites in your style that's a fun idea i hadn't had that like the redesign like radicalize the sites or something i teardowns work i don't love the word because i think it has a real negative connotation like you suck and here's why i prefer build-ups or just critiques where it's like hey you got like 80 percent of something that's awesome i have a few ideas on how you can make it better that's that's kind of like my vibe but I know what you mean. It's the same thing. It's just, I, I get really caught up on like the exact words that you use for stuff because there's a lot of implication and thoughtfulness that's behind that. You're, you're actually so right. Someone gave me this exact feedback yesterday when I was speaking about podcast teardowns. They're like, oh, I don't quite like that. Let, let's make it more positive because I, I want people to make better podcasts. Yeah, critique, reviewed feedback, all those work fine. Yeah, I just think teardown, I'd love to see. It's a very common word and I'd love to see people stop using it. Uh, Jack, let's finish on one last thing. And yeah. you are a dabbler in so many different things over the years you've been exploring different ways to express your creativity i remember one of those when we last talked was jack is learning i love this dude i love this this was you learning new things and documenting it what happened to that and what are you dabbling with at the moment i had a lot of fun with that and what happened was i couldn't learn new things i stopped being able to um with the brain with the brain fog stuff um, it was such a struggle to retain even just, you know, short-term memory, which has gotten better now. Like maybe I could bring it back. You know, I'm thinking about like, what do I want to do? Um, but I really struggled to come up with like anything new that I could learn and actually like have it stick. So that I, I, I shelved that, uh, what I'm, I'm dabbling on right now. I mean, really I am trying to let my mana recharge from summoning, radical design, you know, like there's this, I have this idea of, uh, of creativity being like a mana pool, like in a, in a fantasy, like video game or, or whatever you have only so much and you use it all up and then you can't cast any more spells. But if you just wait, if you like, just relax for a little bit, it comes back, it all renews. And so that's what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to not overexert my creative muscles at the moment because I used every ounce of everything up getting that course live. So I know if I can give myself some space to let them come back, I can add more stuff to the, to the course. I can take on new ideas, really focus on static for a while because after mm-hmm. working on the course, like there was things that were just kind of put into coasting mode that, yeah. you know, some things are fine, but eventually like they, they won't survive coasting forever. And so I have to pick up and, and move that stuff. So focused on static, focused on flat camp, which is later this summer and like our, our conference event. And I have some other stuff that's like on the back back burner that I can't talk about that may or may not ever happen. And we'll see what happens there. That's mm-hmm. just super vague. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. I, you know what? I, I would love to have disagreed with you more in this episode because I think it's interesting when you have a different viewpoint with a guest, but I find myself pretty much agreeing with everything you said, especially on the creativity being a limited resource for you. And it's something that if you use a lot of, you have to build up. I think rest and play is so important for being able to be at your best producing. I also think there's nothing wrong with coasting. If you want to for a while, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of hustle culture in the world. Just enjoy yourself sometimes, dude. And then once you're refreshed and relaxed, you can come and uh, spend another four years creating something new. I mean, it's (laughs) probably going to happen. I I can't stop creating. You just just have to take little breaks. (laughs) Agreed. Well, Jack, mate, thank you so much for coming on this episode of Mate Lemonade. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. Okay, all right.